Ron Chaplot, author of Fanatical Prospecting and Sales EQ, and welcome to another episode of Sales Masters. With me today is Patrick Tenney, the author of an amazing book called Unlocking Yes. This book is about negotiation, but it's better than just about negotiation. It's about negotiation for salespeople. And Patrick and I are going to spend some time helping you understand what you need to do to become a better negotiator and some of the tips and tactics and techniques that will help you get higher prices and better terms and conditions. Patrick, welcome to Sales Masters. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, just enjoying this very much. So before we got started, you were telling me about the process of writing Unlocking Yes. And I may just stop because I wanted you to tell the audience what you went through, because both of us are authors and we, I think we, we, we commiserate about what it takes to actually write a book. So can you, can you help us understand, A, where the idea came from for Unlocking Yes, and the iteration, how you, how you came to, to publish this beautiful book? Well, thank you very much for the compliment to begin with. Um, you know, it was uh, it, like a lot of authors, um, I hadn't really intended to write a book. In other words, you start producing content and then you get, uh, you know, you get uh, nudges from your colleagues and they're saying, you got to write a book, you got to write a book. Um, if, if you've been in business long enough, and I've been in business for four decades, um, you, you become very accustomed to writing very good content internally and you make business cases internally but there's, uh, there are so many nuances that, that come with, with negotiation. So what I started to do is I started to talk about uh, topics that were a little bit on the fringe to begin with. And, and it's just kind of strange. People just started to pile on the rabbit. And so what I would do is I would, in some cases, just send the content out to build my, uh, my brand, my company, uh, and, uh, and, and that I'd get a, a quick email back and be like seven o'clock at night after I'd finished a piece and I'd just pick up the phone call right away and I would just say, hi, I'm here. I, you know, what are you interested in doing? And then it took off. So anyway, long story short is it took a long span to write the book because I wanted to write um, a sales negotiation book that was collaborative with the customer, that was wide ranging, that was strategic. And to me, that was really important because one of the things that um, I have understood for a long time is that most people do not understand a great breadth about strategy. And I think strategy is one of the most important parts about negotiation. You, and my book is a combination of lo largely strategy, but supported support by the tactical part of it. Let's go back to a, a foundational problem that I see. And I'd like to get your opinion on that. And that is that in our culture, unlike other cultures around the world, we have a tendency to see negotiation as something that is bad or, or icky or unsavory. And, and I, I want to get your opinion on why that is, why do we have those hangups and how does that impede our ability to cross over that emotional barrier to, to sit, you know, sit down with a, a client and negotiate a, a collaborative outcome? Wow. That's a great question. <laughs> you know, I, I think, and I've thought about this for a long time, Jeff. So you've, you've asked one of those amazing questions. Uh, that not enough people think about. But my own sense of it is, is that uh, we learned how to negotiate by growing up in a family who either negotiates a lot, they communicate a lot, or they don't. And you've either grown up in a family where there was a family business or, or, you, or you didn't. And um, the other thing is, is that uh, I, it, it's almost, it's, it's a personal thing. Negotiating is a personal thing. And for, for reasons that I cannot understand is that, is that, um, and, and I, there, part of it I can understand. We were in a, what I would call a, um, a seller's market from uh, 1950 to about the year 2000. So in other words, there were way too many buyers and there weren't enough sellers. And so the whole concept of win-win, which was developed um, uh, by uh, Mr. Yuri uh, with, with the Harvard gang, was uh, created in a, an atmosphere where the sellers always had the upper hand. Well, around the year 2000, with the internet, with, with globalization and all the rest of it, it flipped over. And so now you had too many sellers because you got people selling from all over the world and they're selling in. And the way that negotiation uh, was being conducted started to change. And it was exacerbated around 2008 with the financial collapse. And then all of a sudden, CapEx budgets around the world collapsed and everybody 
tightened up like a clam. It was just like you, could, you, you couldn't get that oyster open. You couldn't get that baby to pop. So um, I, I think that the buyers became so strong that sellers didn't know how to respond to that. And the problem became is uh, uh, one that where sellers said, all right, well, we'll sell harder. Well, selling harder doesn't necessarily get a deal across the finish line. You have to understand strategy. See, when I talk to people, let me just throw one more thing at you. When I talk to people, I've done over 50 book signings. I know you've done a bajillion because I've, I've watched you, uh, you know, uh, with your various videos, and they're always really fun and, and entertaining. But I've talked to thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and I always ask them on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you see yourself as a, as a business negotiator? Now, you've got a number, Jeb. I'm, I don't want I don't want to know what your number is. But I can tell you, after talking to all those people, the number is between 6.5 and, and 7.5 and out of 10, 10 being the highest. And then I ask them, so how many negotiation strategies can you name? And when do you use them for time compression and or buy or sell a risk? And you know what the answer is? One or none. When I was in, you know, carrying a briefcase and selling, I was a worse negotiator at the beginning of the quarter and a better negotiator at the end of the quarter. And I, and I noticed this pattern consistently that at the end of the quarter, I was getting higher commission checks, better terms and conditions. I was giving away less to get the deal closed. And at the, at the beginning of the quarter, I was, you know, I was giving away everything. And, and this was when I was in my mid twenties. So 24, 25, 26, really early on noticed this pattern. Yeah. And, and the, and the, the industry that I worked in, the, the levers for commission, making more money were so big when you started moving your prices up and when you start giving away things that we could not negotiate out that it was so it was in my best interest to be in better negotiator at the end of the quarter or, or excuse me at all the all the time so the the problem that that I, I faced was i figured out what my problem was i just couldn't fix it and that was that at the end of the quarter i'd made my quota i didn't need the sell and when i didn't need it when i when i detached from it emotionally I was looking at, I'd look at a buyer in their eyes and say, this is, this is how much it costs. This is what we have to do. This is why these add-ons are there. This is why this is there. And at the beginning of the quarter, I was giving away the farm before I ever negotiated. I, and in fact, I was afraid to negotiate because I was afraid I might lose the deal. So, so let's, before we start talking about negotiating strategies, like, you know, so for example, you know, holding onto your leverage, time compression, those type of things, let's just get down to the basics. Why does that, what are the emotions around becoming a better negotiator? And I, I can tell you intellectually, I can, I can, I, I know this today in my own business. I'm a better negotiator when the pipeline's completely full and I'm a worse negotiator when the pipeline's empty. You know, it's just, it's just simple, basic stuff. But it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, it's not, the, the pipeline has nothing to do with my ability to negotiate. It's my emotional state that has the ability to, you know, has a lot to do with how I negotiate. And then, and then frankly, sometimes I just don't feel like negotiating. So sometimes I just, I take what I can get because I don't, I don't want to go through the hassle of doing it because I still don't like the way it makes me feel. <laughs> well, you know what, uh, Jeb, my friend, you <laughs> You are a part of the masses. Um, you know, what we have to do is we have to say to ourselves, um, can we separate the business side of the negotiation from the EQ side of the negotiations? And one of the things that I noticed about myself, uh, and uh, let me just sort of frame this for you. A large negotiation for me uh, in the uh, sort of mid uh, 1990s uh, was around 12 to $13 million. One client with one signature on either side of the contract. There wasn't a committee signing this thing, just the two of us. Now move that forward in, in, in today's dollars and you can just imagine how big that was, right? Um, effectively in those days, it was 150 jobs that would go bad if I got it wrong. Uh, not saying that deals that big are gonna go wrong, but it's just, you have to really focus, right? And so uh, you have to, yeah, you have to pull yourself away because if you've got a partner who is collaborative, but it, it's one of these partners that the contract is so big and you realize that your brand alignment works, but the other side gets paid to drive prices down. This is, this is what procurement officers do. My side gets paid to get the deal across the finish line, 
but grow the piece of the pie so that we're growing our revenues and we've, we've got incentive for the customer to, uh, to stay in it. And by the way, we're always trying to grow out contiguous business, which we don't currently have, which our competitors have. And those are, and you've talked about that in your, in your, uh, in your book, we call them conversions, mm -hmm. right? Big money conversions. So uh, it, it, it's this, it's the workup. And one of the things I, I want everybody to understand is that when you get into important negotiations, professional negotiators start collecting information months in advance of a large contract. Like they don't do it the week before they're, they're attending meetings and they're talking to customers about, geez, I noticed this in your industry. How are you going to manage that? Um, notice that one of your competitors is, you know, is, is having some supply chain problems. How are you going to approach that? Um, so for instance, in Canada here last, uh, last month, we had Sears close uh, best part of 80 stores. And so that's going to have a huge effect on a, um, a large retailer here uh, called Leon's Furniture, who is in the furniture business. And Sears have been a, a very large seller of appliances. That obviously opens that up for them. So uh, it's, it's understanding the marketplace, which you, you, you and I both agree on. And then it's understanding your cost modeling. It's understanding your objection, uh, objectives on your side. And it is it is extremely important to understand and have total clarity on the, on the customer's objectives. Sometimes people miss this. And the biggest fault that I see in, in people that go in to negotiate is they don't do enough workup. And then they go in and they, and they, and they believe that they're going to get at the table. They're going to hammer something out, but they do it on the basis that they're a counter puncher. So, so let's, let me dial this back. So, so number one, um, we talked about emotional control. So we, the, the pattern that I noticed with myself was that when I needed the deal, I was a worse negotiator than when I didn't need the deal. So when you can detach from the outcome and have greater emotional control, you walk in the door automatically a better negotiator. Uh, confident sales, it, 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 that transfers to the buyer when they see that you're, you're confident about, about your position. Correct. But what makes you confident about your position, aside from... I didn't need the deal is discovery. Discovery is the heart and soul of negotiation. So this is the mistake that I see with so many salespeople. They are negotiating on the basis of nothing. Like they have nothing. They're haggling out a price, but they don't understand what the buyer's particular objectives are. What are the roadblocks? What's, what's their situation? And, you know, and, and they're, they had the opportunity, in, in essence, if we were to use this you know, as, a, as a poker game analogy, but they had the opportunity to see all of their buyer's cards. The person sitting on the table, they can see every card they have. Imagine if you're playing poker and you can see all the cards at the table, you're probably going to you make better decisions. But we don't do that because we don't take the time to, to, to engage. And at the smaller level, uh, Patrick, one of the things I see now, you're talking about $13 million negotiations, but I mean, a lot of times, you know, people are negotiating, you know, get a $10,000 deal. As I see salespeople take the red herring of negotiating early in the process before they walk through the entire process. So once again, they're back to negotiating a price in the vacuum of no additional information. So it sounds like discovery is like a big piece of this, understanding that that that's the foundation of strategy the loudest voice in the room is not necessarily the room the person in the room who's going to be the smartest at the negotiation table and quite frankly your your, your commentary around a, a poker table i i used to play a lot of no limit poker uh and so at a poker table we're all looking for tells and and, and what we try to do is we try to uh, start off with um i either understanding who the table captain is or, or who the person is who's controlling the tempo of the table. And by the way, we want other people to believe other things about us rather than what we feel inside, which is kind of what you're talking about. So the EQ part of negotiation is really important, but the only time the EQ part really kicks in is uh, when there's a lot of money involved, when there's a lot of change involved, when there's a lot of stress involved, or when there's a lot of completeness in our work. So if your work is complete for that negotiation, your cost modeling is done, you understand the roll ups and roll downs in your fingertips, then you go into a negotiating uh, setting and like you're talking about at the end of your quarter, you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, you know what, I, I'd be really interested in knowing what's really important to you. 
So one of the things I see about negotiating is we always give these examples of these really, really big deals. Like for example, I mean, I, the example I use all the time is I'm, I was negotiating a big deal with a Japanese firm and there were, I don't know, 10 people in the room and the negotiation lasted, you know, a month and a half. And it was all of the, the, you know, the, the, the pomp and circumstance and the ritual of going through it. And the guy I was negotiating would never even talked. I mean, he was sitting on one side of the room and I learned early on that I needed an interpreter because I was getting, you know, the best taken out of me. We talk about those things, like these, these epic deals that we negotiate, but I salespeople are negotiating every day, like little things like the time that they're going to be able to walk through a plant and who's going to be walking through with them and the stakeholders that are going to get involved and, and, and small things like, you know, we get hung up in price, but you know, the terms and conditions. And in fact, I see people negotiating price, but they give away everything else in the process as well. So, so I see to me, um, what I see is, is salespeople constantly caught up in the emotions of negotiating both big and small things. And the reality is that if I go back to what you said earlier is a discovery, if I've gone through the entire sales process and I'm at the point where I'm closing, typically what's happened is the prospect has made a decision for me. Like they've made a decision to do business with me. If I've done my job, I shouldn't be negotiating anything until the prospect has decided that they want to do business with me. And I see salespeople negotiating before that fact. So they're having a conversation about whether the person's going to pay this price or not, but the person has not made a commitment to a timeline, to delivery, to um, that person being a vendor of choice or that company being a vendor of choice. So they, in, in essence, are negotiating with themselves. And the, the position that I, I want to be in, in fact, I'm, and, and, and I do get myself in those positions, I lose negotiations when I'm negotiating myself. I almost never lose a negotiation when the person says, I really want to do business with you, but like, that's the point where I can work that out. I can, I can work out a solution and we both have to make a decision at that point, how bad we want the deal. Does the, does the prospect, do they have enough reasons to do business with me if I create enough value so they're willing to give up something in order to get my organization or and 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 this is you know happens to me all the time I've made a decision that like you said there's so much upside to this particular piece of business in terms of getting in the door and building out a relationship that I'm willing to give up something on my side for the opportunity for the long term and you're making those decisions you know all the way through so whether it's cheesecake or whether it's, you know, negotiating who's going to be sitting at the table in a room or are you going to be able to get your hands on your competitors invoices or their proposal or what have you. That's what I see salespeople engaged in all the time. And, and they're afraid. I mean, they're like, how do I get that? I'm afraid to ask. Why am I, why are you afraid to ask me? Why are you afraid to just reach out and get that? Cause once if you, you're either going to get a yes, no, or you're going to get a maybe. And the maybe is what you negotiate. You know, that's, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in like the, 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 from really at the, at the, at the mechanical level of the everyday process that salespeople go through, what's holding them back? What, do, what are the techniques and things that they need to do? Because I, I think that the audience, I think if we think about most of us, most of them are not negotiating, you know, hundred million dollar deals. Most of them are negotiating $5,000, pick up a piece of equipment or, I mean, I, we negotiated a, you know, a $1,200 software purchase, false software as a service purchase for a team, you know, last month and, and negotiation lasted for three days. Yeah. Yeah. Let me guess. You got emotional about it. Well, I wasn't emotional at all. I didn't, I could, I didn't care. No, but if, um, it goes on for, if it goes on for three days, I mean, you know, just think about how much time was used up. It was, it, it was, it, it was, but the long-term impact of buying a subscription for an entire team, like over time, that that adds up in, and and I was emotional on that I wanted to get the best deal for myself. And there was a crack. When I asked for a better price, they said, okay, let's talk about it. So I made a decision to do business with them. I wanted to do business with them. They wanted my business. And I mean, you know, and it was the end, it was the end of a, you know, a buying period. So people clearly had numbers to make. So that's you know, that's the that's the place where I see salespeople everywhere, including my own and including me, 
that's where we begin to make either great decisions or bad decisions. And these, these strategies and tactics start paying off for us. Um, you know, and I'm interested in, in like, how do we teach salespeople in the moment to be better negotiators with the caveat that what you said is exactly right. Discovery is everything. You skip discovery, you skip steps in the process. You're not negotiating, you're haggling and you're usually going to lose. There you go. There you go. You just said it. You know, uh, <coughs> I didn't mean your point, by the way. It should have been a thumb. <laughs> <laughs> I got excited. Um, you know what? The, most people don't understand the difference between haggling and negotiating. Haggling is what happens in schoolyards. Um, there are also some cultures where, um, uh, where forms of haggling are, are respected, expected, and um, they're cultural. Uh, you know, a lot of the open markets that you see uh, around the world, I mean, this, this is the, it's, an, it's an art form over there, but it's usually on smaller cost items. So um, I want you to know, I want the audience to know, everything in negotiation is scalable. So remember I got talking about our families earlier and you were talking about your cheesecake. That's a family issue. That's a personal issue with a family. And you're trying to sort of say to that person, you know, uh, you know, uh, that cheesecake means so much to me. How much does it mean to you? Sort of thing. <laughs> anyway, we, we won't get too deeply in that, but it's to say that you, you have to understand um, a few things. You have to understand what competitive sets there are around the industry that you're, that you're dealing with. You have to understand. One of the things I go through in the book is a SWOT analysis. I, go, I, I, uh, I ring fed a SWOT analysis. We SWOT ourselves, which is very difficult to do because it's really difficult and sometimes embarrassing to sort of say, here are our weaknesses. You talk about, um, in your book EQ, murder boarding. And I just, I, I loved it. I, I just thought, oh man, he's taking business implications and he's just pounding the heck out of it. But that's what makes you great in a negotiation. Because what you, the next thing you do is you go look at your competitor and you will look at all of their key leverage points and say, these are the things that they're going to use as the strength, if, I'm, uh, if I've got a competitor in the negotiation, which happens all the time, and um, I have to understand their key leverage points. I also have to understand their weaknesses because I, I, you know, I, I may at some point have to insert one of those. I don't do it um, uh, with any malice. It's just, it's just part of business. It's just like we deliver better than they deliver on this. And by the way, that's empirical. I can proof it up, right? Period. When I first wrote the programs around Unlocking Yes, uh, I thought back to myself, and I said, right, so what's really important about negotiation? Well, number one is that you want to remove as much negative risk as you can. So if you know that there are issues that customers have around risk, you want to remove those. Um, the next thing is, is you want to raise positive risk. So you want to make sure that when you go into the negotiation, you don't come out with less than when you w went in with. And you want to stretch yourself, you want to stretch your company, you want to stretch the customer. Um, the, the third part is, is there will be this back and forth. Now you, you sort of talked about it as being those icky little parts. I just sort of look at it as, as, as very direct conversation pieces. Uh, culturally, uh, just before I finish this, uh, you talked about, uh, being in Japan and there being a lot of, uh, of ceremony. The very earliest, uh, book on strategy, uh, was written in the Far East, um, and it was written by a Chinese general. It's called um, The Art of War. And it's, it, it, this book is like almost like, I don't know, it's over a thousand years old. But most of the um, negotiation culture from uh, the Far East is built on pieces of that book. Now, in, in, in uh, Japan, it will be slightly different than it would be in China. Uh, uh, China, uh, if you read any of Tony Fang's work, and I recommend friends that you do. So he wrote a book on uh, ne negotiation uh, uh, Chinese style. And, and it's a brilliant book because uh, he talks about how culture, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the three pieces of philosophy that they have in, in, in China really set up a base for negotiation. And India is even more different from, from that. The United States uh, is, is a very um, 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 clearly spoken, we understand uh, what we want, we get it up on the table early. And by the way, 
we've also inserted things called procurement departments. Now, procurement departments are not the same as buyers. Procurement people are, in many cases, uh, they're accounting people, uh, they are people that are statistic uh, database people, and all they do is focus on the price and taking the price and, as the Chinese would say, squeezing the water out of it, and, uh, and they want to get it down to nothing. I was talking to a colleague yesterday that sells software, and, he, and I don't think he sat in front of too many procurement people, and he had another uh, big deal coming up. And I said, you have, to ha you have to understand how they buy in that scenario. You have to understand how they buy, not how we sell. Yet when you're when you're dealing with a company whose culture is built on austere uh, on being quite austere, uh, being modest, and or you're uh, dealing with a company whose whose idea is to be disruptive in in, in the space, then it, those negotiations become uh, very um, they, they grind, they grind, and and you have to rely on your cost modeling and your intelligence and building value. And by the way taking the risk out of the deal. Because one of the worst things that can ever happen to any of us is that we sign a deal that we don't like, and then we have buyer's remorse. And I will tell you that if you sign a deal that you don't like, it will leak on uh, implementation. I'm the on the street sales guy. Mm -hmm. And the on the street sales guy is not reading the, the, the art of war, not looking at procurement people, not looking at that stuff. The guy on the street is trying to sell a truck. Right. Well, we're trying to sell a software program in the moment to a buyer. So when we talk about taking risk out of the deal, let's, let's talk about what that really is. Like, what does that really mean to the individual salesperson? Because I get, you know, I get there's a group of business people negotiating some large deal, but most of us are not. Most of us are, right. are negotiating something that's, that's a low cost, right? Overall low risk to the business, although there, there is a high risk to the individual buying it. And dealing with purchasing and you know those groups, if you if you're stuck in purchasing, the problem is you created that problem. I mean, you got stuck in purchasing. That's how you ended up there. So for me, it's I always start at before I get to purchasing. If if purchasing is my only way to buy something, I'm haggling. I promise you, I'm haggling, because the purchasing department is going to look at the price, and that's what they're going to deal with because they don't care about the employment impl the implications. So if I don't have a sponsor in the organization, if I don't have someone who I'm selling to, for example, I, if, I want, um, if I want to sell sales training, for example, I go to P&L owners. I don't go to people who don't have a P&L. I'm, I don't want to sell to the head of sales. I don't want to sell to HR. I want to sell to the person who runs the division. Why? Because the person that runs the division's got juice. Now, am I going to have to negotiate with the people that are in HR and the people that are that are in you know in the sales organization? Absolutely, those folks are going to negotiate with me, but I've got leverage because the guy who has or the woman who has the the money is is where I started, and so I understand why they're bringing me in, why would they would spend the money, why they would do these things. So as I begin negotiating terms and conditions with these other folks who don't have money. I'm able to use that person to block stupid things that are going to take away from my ability to sign a deal that I'm not going to resent. Because that's, that's, you're exactly right. I don't want people to resent the deal. And another example for taking risk out, you know, early on in the process, if we look at, you know, software implementation, any kind of business service implementation, the highest risk to the company is that you disrupt their operations while you implement the program. Like that's their biggest problem. But salespeople don't focus on that. What salespeople are focusing on is, is the price. So they get the price first, rather than de-risking the process by creating a, a set of implementation dates and timelines that they get people to agree to up front before they're negotiating. So I'm negotiating whether or not we will start implementing your program on this date or this date, not how much will it cost for us to do that. And I think that's one of the things that I see is that we're negotiating a lot of times the wrong thing. We're negotiating with ourselves. We're negotiating in a vacuum. And, and I, I want to dial into specific things that right. individual salespeople can do yes. using the techniques in your book to become net better negotiators. I, I mean, I, I love, I love talking about the epic. I love talking about the strategy and the, you know, and the, you know, the philosophy, but the reality is, is that, you know, right now somebody's listening to us and they got to go out and hit the street and they're going to be in front of a buyer in about three hours. 
and they're going to know what to do. And they're, and they're negotiating a thousand dollar add on charge to do, you know, to do a delivery versus the customer picking it up. I mean, you know, stuff like that. Make sense? Yeah, no, perfect. It, it does. The only reason I brought procurement into it is, is that increasingly that's what's coming into play in, in the marketplace across a lot of streams. And I, I, I I'm just bringing that in. Let well, me well, to, to some extent, I mean, we, we procurement did, I mean, if we go back and look at say 15 years ago, we had a major problem with procurement and that was the reverse auctions. So the reverse auctions began to come into to play big time. And, yeah. and, and they're start, pernicious. And you don't, they, they, but they, they, you can see that the reverse auctions have, that they've run their course. And I'll give you an example. I worked for a company. I was the VP of sales for this company and we made a decision culturally that we would not engage in a reverse auction. And we went to customers who would call us in and say, we have a reverse auction. And we said, we're not playing. And a few of them told us to go pound sand, but a bunch of us brought, a bunch of them brought us in and we were able to change the terms because they needed us. We had, you know, we had leverage, we had prices, we had information, we had things that we could do. And, and that is brand alignment. Okay. That's, well, well, that's, well a, that's a big word, Patrick, and I'm, I'm going to challenge you on that. So let's okay. don't call it brand alignment. That's called, I'm not going to play your stupid game. So, I mean, we're talking about leverage here, right? So, for example, when the customer says, hey, this is how you play the game, we go, we're not playing that game. It's the same thing if you get an, a blind RFP. I'm not, I'm not sending in your blind RFP. Yeah. So if you, if you say, I'm not going to do those things, you're negotiating the terms of engagement at the very beginning. Like you begin shaping the end negotiation there. Is that and so, and, and so um, to answer your, your questions and, and, and I'm, you, I'm just, I'm just going to be the guy who, I'm, 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 I want to keep it real. I, I don't want to use, big words. I don't want to use big strategy. We got, we got somebody right now that's counting on you to yeah. teach them what they need to do to go out and make a better deal. <laughs> so here's what we have to do. Uh, so we've, we've, we've been through the whole idea of, of, of you have to do your, uh, your discovery. One of, the, one of the important things that I think that people are afraid to do in the environment that we're in right now is ask really hard questions around qualifying. And that's what splits uh, the wheat from the chaff. Uh, why, why, why is that so? Why are we, like, where does that fear come from? And Because I, I love what you said, because that, that early on qualifying, and I'm not talking about intrusive, but that early on qualifying, that does allow you to shape the end negotiation. So why are you saying that people are afraid to ask the hard questions up front? Well, you know what? I, again, we're, um, I'm, I'm just going to say that, that, that money, uh, we've been through a period where money has been tighter than we were used to in years past. So uh, things are, are a little bit tighter. There's more competition. There are more sellers than there have been historically because it's it, it, we live in a, a marketplace where you know you can have somebody dialing in from a, a country that's like 4,000 miles away with a competitive bid so um, there, there's two levels of qualifying here that, I, that I'd like to talk about one is the qualifying that happens up front so that we have a clear understanding of their objectives and we match them against our objectives and what we're trying to do is we're trying to close a gap in there and the closer we can come on on a linear basis and for, in my particular case I like to call it an expectation gap. And when I get close to that expectation gap, getting that far away, then we enter what is known as the, uh, the bargaining continuum, which is where we can go back and forth and begin to try and decide whether we can get a deal done. And by the way, it's gotta be profitable. I mean, the worst thing you can do is go into uh, an organization where they say, I don't care, Jeb, if you make a profit, I'm just gonna buy. And if you don't wanna buy at the price that I'm selling at, we're not doing a deal. And your position was the inverse. You're saying, I'm not going to go into a culture that is pernicious where everything is game theory and win-lose, they win, we lose. You've eliminated those people. And part of that understanding is, is knowing the kinds of, of things that they're doing to you. You know, it's like uh, there's a whole bunch of, of things that people can do you, that you can identify really quickly. Like some people say, well, I have no money. Well, if you have no money, why are we talking? Oh, you don't know how bad it is here. I have no money. Well, that, that's, that's, that's a piece of a strategy. I, I refer to that as poor mode. And you can see that in organizations. I was dealing with one of the largest retailers in Canada. I mean, we're talking huge, right? And they wanted a, a negotiation program. And all of a sudden, they come up and they say to me, oh, I can't afford that. I said, seriously? And, and the person gave it, oh, yeah, but you got to understand, this is, a, this is my department budget. I'm going, yeah, but 
you know, you, you want to train all these people. Yeah, I know, but it's in my department. I don't have a lot of money. There's, there's a great story in the book where I'm talking with an MBA and uh, her dad owned a, um, a business that made um, uh, small industrial uh, tools. Anyway, long story short, she said, oh yeah, she says, I've heard that we got no money. And she said, then, yeah, and there's another thing. This, this old buyer used to come in and say to my dad, ah, you know, Frank, we says, we've been through some tough times, you and I together, and I just don't have any money. And, you know, I know you want a dollar a unit for these things, but I can only afford 40 cents a unit. And she said, my dad would look back and go, holy smokes. I mean, I can, I can, I can barely make it for that. And, and, and then the crescendo is the guy would look across and he'd say, all right, let's split the difference. Well, what the, what the, what the person has done there is they, they've employed two strategies to make uh, a, a, a super combo strategy and the average person wouldn't necessarily see it coming. So this is why you have to have a greater understanding of, of how a lot of, these, a lot of these things work. And it can happen on a very small negotiation on a, a thing that only costs a dollar, right up to whatever size you wanna go. I see it all the time. That's for me what, what I see salespeople doing. It's, it's a red herring. So at the very beginning, you get, an, you get an upfront negotiation, like I can only do it for so much, right? And, yeah. and the salesperson goes for it hook, line, and sinker. Now they're haggling a price with no information, with no discovery versus saying, that's great. I got that. Let me learn a little bit more about you and what you need and what you want. Because what they don't know is that the guy that's saying, you know, I only, I'll only pay 40 cents a unit has got an order from a client that they have to fulfill. And they've got to fulfill that in three weeks. And you don't know that. Like you have, so you gave away all your leverage. You negotiated with yourself before you got there. And you allowed your emotional need to close the deal to get the best of you. And the person that says, hey, I don't have any money, like you said, it's a logical thing to say to yourself, if you don't have any money, how come we're talking? Like, why are we having this conversation? So it doesn't make, people don't do illogical things on purpose. We wouldn't be having the conversation if they didn't have any money. So what you have to do is allow that to go, and we, we call it the matrix move, right? You just go, shh, let it go by. Yeah. Don't deal with that. Start asking questions and doing discovery so that at the end of the meeting, you can make a decision whether or not you want to remain engaged or move on. Because, you know, for me, it's like there's a couple of things at play here. One of them is, is it a fit for me? And I, I um, we, we disengaged from a, a deal we were working on because we realized culturally it wasn't a fit. We were always going to be treated as a vendor and we were going to be ordered around. And even though the, the client said, you know, we want to, we want an integrated partner with us, but it wasn't going to be like that. And we, we didn't, we, we didn't want to, you know, be the, um, you know, the dog getting wagged by the tail. So we made a decision to disengage from something because we couldn't negotiate better relationship terms. I mean, it was not possible to do that. But the flip side of that is the person that says I'll need money, because I had somebody tell me they need money yesterday. And I went, okay, well, probably sounds like we shouldn't be working together. And they went, well, no, 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 no. I went, oh, okay. Well, so so what do you want to talk about? Well, blah, 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 blah. So as I listened to them, it was it wasn't a departmental issue. It was a negotiating strategy that they had learned. Like that, let's throw it up front. And I wouldn't play the game. And when I wasn't willing to play the game, they came back. And sometimes you go, it's probably not going to work out because there's no way that I can do it for that much. And they go, okay, thank you. And you saved yourself a ton of time because now you know where they stand. But what I find, like you said, the fear of asking questions is most salespeople aren't willing in that moment to either confront the issue and call it for what it is, do a takeaway on it, or they are they are so eager that they allow their emotions to run wild and they, they they dive headlong into a negotiation we don't have money well how much money do you have well i only have this much money well what if i could do it for this i mean we're having we don't even know the basis of the of the problem and we don't know we don't even know sometimes whether the person has the authority to buy we don't have it yet and there's no no info you're, you're dealing with what we call a seeker like you talked about sales eq with you're yeah. dealing with a seeker Who's, who is negotiating, you know, I, I always say, you know, there's a $10 an hour person negotiating on behalf of a $25 billion company. How does that work? It doesn't work. This well, is the no way. When you're, and we're back, let's go back to the on the street negotiation. So you have to know how much you want to spend. You have to know as much as, as you can about the product that either you're buying or you're selling. You have to know about 
any of the variables in, involved in this. I, I remember I had a friend of mine who said, uh, Patty says, uh, it was when GM was getting out of the Pontiac business. He said, I found this little micro up at a dealership. And uh, he said, I want you to help me come up and close out the deal. He says, you're the negotiator. And I go, all right, all right. So we'll go up. And I said, uh, I said, what did the car originally list for? And he goes, oh, it was around, I, I think it was around $13,000. I said, well, what are you down to now? He says, oh, we're down around $9,000. I says, my God, you've, <laughs> you've, you worked this poor guy down. He says, yeah, I know, but he says, I think there's, he says, you come up. He says, you're smart. So anyway, <laughs> not that I'm smart, by the way, but anyway, I am persistent. So anyway, I went up and so I, I got talking to this guy and uh, anyway, I said, all right, so we, we, we're pretty close here on price. I mean, we're going to ask for just a tiny bit more here, but what can we do on soft costs? And all of a sudden you see the salesperson's eyes just light up like a Christmas tree. He goes running back into the car dealership and he says, Get in here really quick. Nobody talks about soft costs in a car dealership. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyway, we went in there and, and the funny that uh, I'll, I'll just give you a funny little story in this one. So we're in this deal. I'm asking for a little bit more. I'm asking for some detailing and I'm asking for a break on a, a long term uh, uh, service agreement because, you know, if Pontiac gets out of the business, then we want to be assured that we have access to parts and all the rest of this stuff and good service. And so finally, the guy looks over and he says, I, I'm not, this is a sales manager. I'm not going to accept this deal. And all of a sudden, somebody walks in with a cherry pie. And I, I'd heard about this before, but I'd just never seen it in action. And she says, because you've test driven this car, you're, you're, a, you're, um, you're entitled to, and yet you've won a cherry pie. And I look back at her and I said, no, I'm sorry. I said, my, uh, my, my, uh, my friend here and I are, we're both allergic to sugar and our families are too. So please give it to somebody else. What they're trying to do was they were trying to break our, mm -hmm. our focus and give us something small so that we'd have to give something big back later. And I, I, I recognize that in the moment. And that's what, this is the focus on the, on the EQ and understanding what people are doing to you. And I leaned across the table and I finally said to the sales manager, I said, listen, we've eaten up at least two or three hours of, of your salesperson's time. I got to figure that's worth a dollar amount. I'm sitting here in front of you and I got to think that you're uh, uh, worth uh, so many hundred dollars of an, of an hour. So I pushed the deal across the table. I said, you can't, if you don't sign this deal and I walk out, you're down this much money just by sitting there, not signing the deal. And he looked back at me and he says, sign the deal, get this guy out of here, get him down to finance and get him out of here. <laughs> so many influence frameworks in there, you know, especially the cherry pie, you know, inf the, the obligation framework. So giving it to you, it's a deep seated thing for us as human beings. If someone gives you something, you want to give something back. And you can do the same thing in negotiations, but I, I love what you did, but you did it on the, on the, on the buyer side versus on the seller side right. is, is you quantified the, the soft costs, the, the cost of not doing something, the risk, the upside risk of not doing something. And a, a lot of salespeople don't do that. I, I, I watched the salesperson do this masterfully, masterfully uh, with a, a client where she, she went in with a higher price. So her rate was higher than the competitor. And the, the, the buyer, of course, said, you know, apples to apples, this rate's too high. Like you're, it's higher than the competitor. How can you justify this? And she says, well, you have to send two people over to the competitor every day in order to get the service that you pay for. They have to go there. And because you're, the, the, my competitor is uh, not available for you, you're having them sit out in front of the competitor's office waiting to get the service that you paid for. And, and you told me that your people, they're 20 bucks an hour. So every day they're out there for two hours, it's 80 bucks a day that you spend to get this service. And if you, if you add that up, it's this much. So if you look at my rates compared to my competitor rates, I'm actually putting this much money in your pocket. And the buyer reached across the table and signed the deal. But that goes back to discovery. She had done her homework. She understood the value, the cost of the buyer doing that. And she didn't expect the buyer to logically understand that. The, the buyer at the emotional level was just looking at two rates. It, she had to change the way it looked. And you did exactly the same thing on the buyer side. So you're sitting there in front of the car, you know, the, the dealer, the manager, and you're saying, listen, you've spent all of this time doing this. Are you willing to lose this much money so that I walk on this deal? There was a, 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 another thing here that I think is important, and that is understanding what you can give away. So we often get so caught up in negotiating a price 
that we forget that there are soft costs, like there are soft things. There are, there are delivery dates that can be moved or changed. There are, there are, um, are, are add-ons that we can give that don't cost us any money at all. And the problem that we face is we, we put all of those into a deal and we never take them back. So for me, right, so when I'm in a situation, what, what I believe, like one of my core tactics is you never give unless you get something back. So if, some, if you said to me, for example, well, I need you to do this. So part of our training programs, um, I shouldn't probably say this, I'm going to give away my negotiating strategy, but <laughs> part of our training programs, we offer anchor sessions. So we yeah. typically, we, when we go on site and train, we'll do four anchor sessions afterwards. Yeah. Usually one of my trainers does an anchor session. So it costs me money. I mean, there's real cost to it. I pay the person for the time that they're in the anchor session. And, but we, what we also know that as trainers, it, it adds a lot of value because if we can go back in and we can spend a month, you know, once a week with the people that we trained, the, the, the training material is more likely to stick. So everybody wins in this situation. But when someone comes at me and says, I'm not willing to pay this for training, then we can take that back off the table. There is value to it. I mean, there's value to doing that, but we have that as a way of saying, if, you know, in this particular environment, we've priced ourselves to include this in, but if you want to do at this price, we, we won't do those sessions. The good news is that most people see the value in those sessions and they understand why they're there. And by, by using that as leverage, we're able to help them get out of the apples to apples comparison and start thinking about the overall value of the deal that we presented them. And I think every salesperson everywhere has some of those intangibles or some of those things that they, they can keep in their back pocket. The problem is they never take them away. Like you, 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 like you, put, you put your deal together, you say, it's gonna be this, 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 and this. And right. the buyer comes back and says, well, I will only pay you this. The salesperson negotiates the price without <laughs> ever pulling anything else off the table. So, you know, it's like in, in the car dealership example, if the sales manager had said, well, I'll give you this price, but I'm not doing the detailing. You know, the detailing, yeah, I mean, there's some cost to them to do the detailing, but the people that they're going to be, it's a fixed cost for them. For you, it means a lot, right? Having the thing washed, all those things. So you may say, but I really want to wash the thing myself. I mean, I want it to look good. And we have to re realize, I think, where our leverage is. And, and like my like, number one rule for negotiating, Patrick, is I never, ever, ever give, take, you know, give something away unless I get something back. There has to be a fair value trade in any negotiation. And, and when you look at it that way, you win. The problem is we go back to, if I didn't do discovery, if I didn't do my homework, if I didn't know all of the things that were happening, if I didn't understand the competitive set, then I'm, I, I, I'm not able to take things away because I'm afraid that if I pull something back, it's gonna hurt me, I don't have any other information. Back to objectives, back to objectives. You have to understand with clarity the objectives on, on both sides and they have to be crystal clear. That is the most important thing. Right, right down to the point of somebody uh, uh, approaching you with a very uh, game theory kind of, we're going to win, we're going to beat you. Um, it, you know, you have, to, you have to have a very open mind to understand who it is you're dealing with. You know, one of the things that strikes me about great negotiations, great partnerships, is that both sides can be competitive within the negotiation but everybody feels good when they leave the table. Never go into a negotiation without at least, you know, it depends on how important the negotiation is, but, uh, but the industry refers to it as a BATNA, B-A-T-N-A, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. All I'm gonna say about that is it's backup plans. So if you push everything up on the table, you got nowhere to go. There was a, um, I've got a relative who owned a, a car dealership and I asked him one time, I said, what is the best piece of negotiation advice you'd ever received in your life? And he paused and he said, oh, yeah. He says, Pat, I remember it well. It was a giant in our business. And he used to say, when you're negotiating, he says, always negotiate as though you're feeling like you're negotiating in a round room so that you can always back up somewhere. And by that, I mean, he was, he was trying to say, there's always something that I can reach into my back pocket with an ad. And it could be, now let me throw some other things at you. You buy licenses, you buy research, you have storage, you talked about timing. What about size and quality? 
and it goes on and on and on. See, it's not all about price. And, and by the way, I, like I've negotiated printing deals where I've said to the, pe the people involved, print the stuff at three o'clock in the morning. I don't care. Match it up with other stuff that's running at the same time. Get the greatest amount of efficiency that you can get out of this deal. But here's the price that I need you to come in at in order to make this work really well. And they go, oh, you're that flexible. I go, yeah, we just want to get it out the door. They go, wow, I can do that. You should always have a plan B. And, and C that, and D and E and F. Yeah, so that you can walk out with something. I mean, you walk out with something better. Even if the plan B is you're going to come back to the table at another time. You're going to, yeah. you're going to come back with something else. Like you're going to, but it, it doesn't have to always be a zero sum game. I'm always looking at, for me, like when I'm negotiating with a client, what's the hassle factor in this? And what am I giving up long-term? Like I, I, I want the money now, like I want the deal now, but if I get the, the, the money now, am I going to live to regret this down the road? Because I've created so much work and hassle for myself. So like you said, you, you know, if I'm dealing with someone and they say, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm saying, listen, I got to have this rate. I got to have this because I've got to be profitable, period. I'm a, yeah. I'm a business. I, I'm, I exist to run a profit. You got to so have this. I'm willing to do these things in order to get this. But I also have to be cognizant on what I'm willing to give away in order to get that so that I don't end up, you know, six months from now on the, you know, the end of regret or resentment. And I think that you know, that's, that's where, like, and I don't think, I don't think the individual salesperson always sees, sees things that way. Myopically, salespeople are trying to get a deal because they need a commission check this month. Correct. But if you service your account long term, you got to think like an entrepreneur, think like a business owner and say to yourself, if I make this deal, at what point down the road am I going to be ready to throw this customer out because they're making me nuts? Or do I have to go and, rene and renegotiate a deal later that's you know, in, in my best interest? And I'm going to say one more thing on that. Sometimes that's the right strategic decision to make. You are so confident in your product. You're so confident in your service. You're so confident that they're going to love you that you're willing to negotiate a deal that's not optimal for your company because you believe that you can prove out the value and you see a cultural fit that you're willing to give up in the short term, but you're going to have to come back and negotiate a better deal for yourself down the road once you've proven that out. But so, that's the strategy. So we refer to that as a, um, a strategic negotiation. Um, and, and it's one where you, you, you know that you're, and, and I'm going to use a term that you may be uncomfortable with, but I'm going to say it anyway. You're buying the business. For a short period of time, yes. you're buying the business, right? I'm not uncomfortable with that at all. Okay, okay. I, okay. I, I mean, because if you've made that decision, yes. like to buy the business, yes. you just have to make sure you're making the decision in the right way. I mean, well, I see people making decisions to buy the business, and, but then they're, they, they bought it, but then they don't have any long-term strategy to increase right. the value of the business. That's right. So what, what, ends up what ends up happening, in my view, is that, is that people don't see the panoramic view of what selling is. So I, uh, I look at, at see, what, what some people do is they, they say, well, sales prospecting is here, consultative selling is here, and negotiating is here, but negotiating is over here in a corner. And we treat these other two differently than we treat that one. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it, to me, it's a panoramic view. It's not a vista. And so if it is a panoramic view, it all has to stitch together. And on the way through, uh, what we learn about their culture, their forward planning, the gaps in where it is that they want to be and where they want to go. To me, I call this, you know, everybody talks about pain points. And I know as an industry um, in sales, we've gotten used to the whole idea of talk about pain, talk about pain, talk about pain. What about times when companies are doing really well? They're flying high. I want to fill that gap to their aspirational point as well. You see, when, here's, a, here's another thing that people are afraid of. They're afraid of to asking hard questions at the beginning. They're afraid of asking hard questions right as you get into the thick of the negotiation, meaning how many people am I negotiating with? What are the relationships that you have with these people? Um, have you, is there any family connections? And it goes on and on and on, right? Because we all know, all right, that there are, there are networks out there that deal with each other and recommend each other. And, and on, the, on the other end, it's like, when you do a deal, you just don't do the deal and then push it out to somebody else to implement. And we all know this happens, right? You go and you follow that deal. You call the customer up, no matter what the circumstances are, you call them up and you say, how's it working? How are you feeling? 
How good do you feel? But this also is leverage, right? So if we know that people, the one thing that, that and this is the number one reason why people don't change, especially in a competitive displacement type situation where you're moving, you're, you're taking an incumbent competitor and moving them out so that you can slot yourself in. The number one reason why they don't change is they're afraid you're going to screw your, their business up in the process. And if they're a, let's just say they're, they're working, you know, they're a, they're, a, you know, a manager, a, let's say a mid-level manager, you, you screw up their, their world. They might not, they might not have a job. I mean, they don't want that level of endorsement. Their job is to, is to mitigate risk to them. So by, by selling things at a rate that allows you to implement in a way that is um, creates excellence for your, and a great outcome for your buyer, you're able to get testimonials that when you're sitting down with the buyers says, I want to get it at this rate, you're able to say, you told me that the thing that you are most afraid of is that if you try the new product, it wouldn't work. It would screw something up. It would hurt you with your customer. It would shut down your line. It would um, cause all of your people to be unproductive if you're dealing with software. You told me those things back oh. to discovery, right? Oh. So you said you value that. If you want that, like I can't come in at this at this price point because I have to be able to pay people to implement. And you know, Patrick, I've used that exact negotiating strategy, and I'm being sincere. I mean, I'm not. This is not a. This is not a. I'm trying to play a game with them. You told me that what you what you valued the most was a vendor who showed up and got it done and didn't create problems. If you want that. You have to give me margin that allows me to put people on that. Otherwise, you're going to keep getting what you've always been getting, which is you you negotiate the lowest possible rate, and then you're unhappy with the outcome. And you're and and if you don't change that 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 paradigm, you're never going to get any better. Now, I've had buyers who said that's okay. I want both of those things. Well, both of those things aren't congruent. You can't have great service and the lowest possible price. It's not congruent. It, and, it's, it's, it's really, the, it's, it's really the, the whole notion of how a quality triangle works. If you want price to be compressed, then we're going to have to compress some quality and or some time. If you want the greatest quality, then that gets associated with the greatest price. And it may involve implementing over a longer period of time. If you want it in two minutes, then it's going to cost you more than it would if, if I'm saying you can run it uh, through the middle of the night when only the crickets can hear you making the stuff having emotional control, not being attached to the outcome, being confident, being able to, and being able and willing to walk away. So yes. when you have abundance in your pipeline, when you have abundance of sales, you're able to do that. Understanding what your limits are, being willing to walk away, not only I, I need the deal, but I'm not willing to take a deal at this particular level or in deep with, with either price or terms and conditions because I don't want this level of pain. It's not going to help my business long term. So understanding what those limits are, right? Getting that information down. What, one important thing I have to insert in here, Jeb, because otherwise we're going to miss it, is price contagion. You have to be very careful because when a price hits the street, especially if you're in, into anything that has uh, the slightest smell of commoditization, and I can tell you everything leaks in the world. So I've had to actually walk away from deals that other people would not walk away from in the corporate world. And I can tell you, my colleagues beat me up. At the time, they beat me up. But you know what? Years later, years later, when they came back to me and said, how do we raise these prices? And by the way, what happened over there? I said, well, I wasn't involved in this one that's gone a little bit too low. I was involved in this one, and I had to walk away from the business. He goes, for gosh sakes, Pat, thank God you did walk away. Can you imagine the mess we'd be in? Because, you know, you think about the United States, you know, if, if, if let's say your customer has, um, you know, let's say they're in every state and you lower a price in one state where that, where that price should not be lowered. And all of a sudden, everybody starts to talk to each other. And all yeah. of a sudden, all of a sudden, margin compression goes down. The other thing you have to watch out is, is, is people compressing time on you. I talk about it as being time compression and time decompression. The longer time stretches out and you're still talking to each other quite engaged, and you have what you would call are those commitments to move through, then you know you're moving well. And you have all the stakeholders involved and mm -hmm. all the stakeholders are collaborating and exploring with you. On the other end of that, you have time compression where somebody calls up and they say, all right, I know everything that goes on in your industry. I have a budget of, uh, let's say for argument's sake, um, something meaningful in our business, I got a budget of uh, $50,000 and I'm gonna make a decision this afternoon, it's Friday afternoon, what's your best deal? Yeah. That you're, you're, that you, you fail every time in those deals if you don't slow the process down. 
Got to it's slow still, down. It's still speed you up to slow you down process. I've and, watched I've watched sales reps get get creamed on that very oh. thing. What it, what it says to you, what it says to you is that any pricing that you do have, you have to have incredibly good databases and files to be able to go back, even with existing customers who are coming back at you on price uh, over and over again. You go, wait a minute, you know. And by the way, prices can go up, and why do they go up? Because of scarcity. And, that, and people say that all the time. I can't charge them this price now. I mean, we charged them that price last time. I, but you're like, but we have less of it now, so we yeah. can charge more. Yeah. And you know, it's why you know why do airplanes cost more right before you're going to get on the airplane than it did three months from now? Because it's just it's 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 supply and demand. It's basic economics. I want to take you back though to the the price integrity piece. This is strategy. If you're, and, and by the way, the individual salesperson, for the most part, you don't get to pick the strategy. Your company's picking the strategy. So yes, so you've got to change. If the strategy is to buy the business, mm -hmm. then the company has to have a mechanism to, to increase those rates over time or reduce prices enough to get margin out of, out of squeeze enough out of those lemons. If you want price integrity, you call it price contagion, but you want price integrity, then you gotta, you gotta stay within a range. And it's interesting when I help salespeople get, you know, close to what pricing is. And I, I, want, I, want, I want them to, I want to get them upfront and personal. I'll have salespeople saying, well, but we can't sell anything because our prices are so much higher than our competitors. And I'll look it over at the manager and I go, can you give it away for free if you wanted to? And in most of my clients, there's somebody in the room that has the ability to go, yeah, I could give it away free. I go, see, your price can be anywhere between zero and whatever you want it to be because you, have, you can make a decision. There are people in this company that can make a decision to give it away for free. It is not the rate. It's the way you see that. It's, it's, it's that your, your, your customer is telling you what your competitor's rates are, and that's where you're getting all of your information, and it is in their best interest to tell you that your competitor is lower than you are. Back to your Japanese scenario, the yes. gentleman sitting at the end of the table, you know what he was doing? He was, he was hiding behind a firewall. Yes. Okay. Uh, it really, um, uh, when, you, when you start dealing with the people who are very professional at this, uh, they send people out who are more or less the soldiers, uh, cannon fodder, if you will. And, uh, and then you've got a, uh, a manager above that who has probably some kind of a channel that they can negotiate in. Once you break out of the channel, then it's got to go upstairs somewhere. And in the you know in the banking business, those are the risk guys. Those are the risk guys. Yeah. They're in there. They're they're going this all day long, looking at the looking at broad, uh, bond spreads and and and, and where uh, you know where this is all going. I got to tell you one more thing is is you know, really important in all this, and that is culture. That is culture. So for instance, I dealt with Walmart head office here in Canada for about a decade. When you walk through the, that door you have to understand the culture. You have to understand uh, the, the, the tactics, the theatrics, and everything that's going to happen when you enter that company. Conversely, uh, I dealt with the Hudson's Bay Company, and it's a different culture. Uh, these guys were street fighters. There used to be one of the, uh, one, at one time, they, would, they had a vice president there who would come up with a baseball bat and swing it as hard as he could around, and he'd turn and look at you and say, what do you got for me today, boys? And it's like, Oh, this is going to be a long day, man. <laughs> you know, at first it's going into, you know, other types of companies, you know, they're all different. But I think that goes back to understanding the deal. So let's say that you are a vendor and you want to sell stuff through Amazon. You're not negotiating. They're, Amazon's the 800 pound gorilla. Here are our terms and conditions. You either accept the terms and conditions or you don't sell on our platform. There are some situations where you say, I just want this deal bad enough that I'm willing to operate inside these terms and conditions. That happens and, and, and you, have to, you, you have to make that decision as a company. You, if you're an individual salesperson, let's say you're, you sell insurance um, you know, to businesses and it's your, your independent and it's your book, you have to make a decision. Am I willing to, you know, to, to, to work with this customer? I'm willing to go chase down a bunch of, of different policies for them. I still don't get to make the complete decision because underwriting is going to do that, but I'm making a decision long-term for this customer. So you have to have those, that understanding. And I think all of that comes into play when we're making a decision about whether we're going to play or not play, where we are willing to, you know, draw the line. And, 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 and also in some cases, 
we have to be, we have to unattach from our desire to win. I mean, this is some, you know, people who are highly competitive so that you can actually get a deal that's going to work for both parties because you want to get the very best deal for you and you're, you walk away prematurely. What, what I want to uh, draw you back to is, um, is the planning process. So, and let's just think, I mean, let's think rapid negotiation. Let's think we're getting into deals where you're walking in and you're negotiating a contract and it's a three call close. Like you're going to, you, you had the first call was that, you know, was connecting with them uh, and doing discovery. The second call, call you, were, you went in and did a, um, you know, a little bit deeper discovery. Say you walked through their location or you did a demo with them. And the third call is you're doing a presentation and asking for the deal. And you're probably going to negotiate the deal at the table. I mean, and, and if you don't get a ne the deal negotiated, you're going into the never, never land of a stalled deal. You may or may not get the deal, but the, the probability that you get the deal after that presentation goes down exponentially if you don't close it on the spot. How should salespeople be preparing themselves um, both mentally and strategically for walking into those situations, which is what 90% of the salespeople out there in the world are doing every day? Great, great, great question, Jeff. So um, in, in that particular scenario, you have to understand who, um, and uh, sorry, if I'm going to use brand alignment again, you're going to hate me, but you have to understand who your closest competitors are that match with the customer's greatest needs. You see, the further you move up the scale in terms of price and quality, and you move away from where the customer is, you, you just mismatch. And if you're way down below, then if you're way down below, you're going to have to buy the business. So generally there are um, a group of competitors that we understand and you have to understand them so closely that it, when, when, you, when you get to that trip point on your profitability and where your profitability must be in order to continue to feed the troops, by the way, because you can sell yourself out of business, right? You, you can sell yourself out of business. And by the way, it's happening these days. It, it, this, this isn't, this is, we're not making this stuff up. You know, people are going out of business because of because of the disruptive pressures that are going on um, inside our world right now. It's it's ha it's happening very rapidly. Uh, so you have to understand that you have to understand what your walk away point is. You have to understand what you're willing to um, associate with your backup plans. You call them your 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 B plan. Uh, I. I call them maybe C, D, E, F. How many? I, I like it. I'm good with that. I mean, yeah. I, I, I like that. I like that you got a whole a whole array of batness. Well, it's agility. You see, yeah. here, here's the thing. Um, if you see, there's a lot of people that are. You, you talked earlier in this in this discussion. This has been a fascinating discussion with you, by the way, because you you're asking some amazing questions. But you see, there's there's a whole pile of people out there that just don't like negotiating. And so what they do is they just kind of say, and these are senior people too. Believe me, it happens. And they'll just say, oh, for goodness sakes, just get me through the process so I can go back to do what I do well. Yep. Right? And, and then there's a group of people who just kind of say, all right, so if, if, we can, if we can just keep this going long enough and we're counterpunching back and forth, eventually we're going to end up near reciprocity, which is what happens a lot in the real estate business. The real estate business is an interesting business because it's kind of a three-trick pony. You know, you, you've either got these uh, uh, reverse um, lotteries, uh, you've got um, uh, you've got uh, let's split the difference or you've got uh, a bully bids on, on properties and it's really one, two or the three that that's mm -hmm. what it's, you know, split the difference, which to me is, is, uh, is just about one of the saddest uh, negotiation strategies in the world. Um, so you have to understand where it is that you can go within these confines. And by the way, and I agree with you totally, you're going to get to some customers. Now you can't do this. And we have, we have to put a caveat on this. If you're, if your company works with an 80, 20, principle, meaning that 80% um, uh, of your business comes out of 20% of your customers, it's very difficult to walk away from one of those deals unless you can replace it with another 80-20. The 80 below are your attrition customers. And, and another thing that's really important here is to understand what your attrition rate is in your business. So some businesses have very low attrition rates with customers, others have larger. The individual salesperson didn't get to make those decisions. So I'm Mary. And I've, I engaged a prospect, I got him on the telephone. I went there and met with them. We made enough connections so that we could move to the next step. Right. I went to their location, or if I'm an inside salesperson, I did a demo, asked questions. I've got a pretty good understanding of the things that are important to them. I'm going in to do a presentation. I'm gonna ask for the business. I yep. think I'm in a pretty good, 
I'm in a good position to get the business because yeah. of the of the relationship that we've built over these three calls. What do I need to do if I'm that rep to prepare to negotiate? Because those no no disrespect, but those things that you were talking about, Mary has no control over that. She's I mean. I mean, other than understanding your competitor, but the 80, 20, all that stuff, she, she's just trying to close a deal. Correct. I, I understand. I, I just, I try to contextualize in there for you. Um, and you're contextualizing in, in, a, in another manner, which is very positive. Uh, so I, I think what you have to understand is, is where a deal is not a good deal. Okay. So, a, so one, one thing we need to understand where our limits are. Correct. So, Okay, so let let's let me I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in a nice bow. So if you're a, if you're a leader, you have to give your salespeople limits. You have to be able to say, here's the place to where you have the ability to negotiate. Now you may have some other people that can that can approve deeper negotiation, but you at least have to give your salespeople the ability to have some level of negotiation. And that's one of the, Patrick one of the big mistakes I see with organizations is that they either have the salespeople can negotiate anything, which ends up with a lot of bad deals or they can negotiate nothing, which ends up with the salespeople having to frustrate the client to come back. Uh, the best ones have, have said, inside these limits, you have right. the ability to negotiate. It, now it's gonna take something out of your pocket, right? It's so first of all, understanding your limits. So, so Mary goes in, knows what her limits are. What's next? Um, you know, I, I think what you have to do is you have to understand how close you are in that bargaining continuum. In other words, um, when, you, when you get looking at objectives, are we, um, where are we separated right now? If we're getting okay. pretty close on price, what other things are separating us? from? Well, she hasn't even done that yet. So they don't even know that she's just, she's walking the door. She's getting prepared, but I can, but I, I'm going to paraphrase what you said, not so much understanding where the, where you are on price, but, but understanding what you believe the probability of being able to get a positive outcome is. So were the people engaged? Right. It, when you were asking questions, were you, when you said, tell me about what's happening, did you get information that gave you a, a much better understanding of their situation? So are you really in a place where you can negotiate a deal in this particular meeting? Because what, one of the things I see, Patrick, is not so much are we far, are far apart on, you know, on pricing, but we have, um, we have these, these issues with the salesperson thinks they're going into a negotiation. Mary thinks she's going in and she's going to negotiate a deal and she's not even close yet. So the buyer isn't ready to buy yet. Right. And, and so she negotiates with herself and the yeah. buyer still walks away and says, I want to think about it. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, that's what the really crafty buyers do, right? Uh, they, um, uh, uh, they, they lead you up, they lead you up, they lead you up. And then it's like, ah, you know what? I just, uh, I just don't know what I'm going to do with this. And I had a buddy of mine used to do this all the time. It was art, Jeff, to watch yeah. it. It was art. Let's, let's understand each other. If we're at the negotiation table together, the chances of us getting a deal done are actually reasonably good. Now, if it's, if it's a cattle call where there's five competitors coming in and it's like gladiator, anything can happen. So let's, let's put that apart, right? Um, but in those cases, right? But that's, but that's the point. Like, so Mary should know what she's walking into. Correct. If there's, if there's three competitors involved, one of them's the incumbent, she's uncovered issues that the incumbent has. Correct. She's a better value proposition than her other competitor. And right. she's and she's connected with the people. They've moved to micro commitments. They've answered her questions. She's in a pretty good position to negotiate a deal. Her probability of getting an, an outcome, a negotiated outcome, maybe 80% or higher. If she's walking in and they're saying, and I had, you know, I had a, um, a we had a, a company come to us and they said, yeah, we're looking at, you know, at, I don't know, eight different training vendors <laughs> and they want to negotiate. We didn't, yeah. we don't negotiate in situations like that. Cause I'm not negotiating until you pick me. So, so what we want to talk about pricing. No. Why? Because if I give you my pricing, I've given away all my leverage. You need me because you're filling out a, a, you know, a column and I'm big enough and, and, you know, in my industry that people are willing to pay attention to that. We, we, we're not willing to give that away. If they say that's okay, we won't work with you unless you're willing to give away all your leverage up front. You have to make a decision inside those terms and conditions, whether or not you're willing to play. So if Mary says, Hey, there's five people coming in, 
then she might want to preserve her negotiation. So she goes in and says, here's my rates. I'm willing to negotiate some things, but I'm willing to, uh, to negotiate under these conditions. Make sense? Yes, if you could have an open dialogue like that. No, there, not every customer uh, uh, is open to that kind of dialogue. Um, I can tell you some of them are, some of the, uh, some of the tactics and strategies they're using these days are pretty, it's, it's hardball. Um, I, so you, but, but, let's, but let's talk about that for a second, Patrick. So yeah. if they're playing hardball, why wouldn't you play hardball back? Your hardball is walk away from the table. Take your prices with you. They need you. They need you. You're, don't give away your leverage for free. And by the way, if they're not willing like to, to come off of their hardball position, you are never going to get the deal anyway. That's where your cost modeling comes in. You see, if, if you understand your cost modeling quite clearly, you know where you can't be. And, and this is what's really important, right? I mean, uh, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, uh, you know, Susie going in and, and she may not understand the full depth of her cost modeling because her boss is back at the office hiding behind a, a fire curtain. Yeah. Uh, so, so he sent her out to get the deal done and, and the deal may or may not close, or she may have to take a pause. You know, there's nothing wrong with taking a pause by the way in a deal. If you feel you're close and I've done this, I got to tell you, it's, it's, I, I was in the middle of a deal with a department store. It was worth about $800,000 and I had my boss with me. This is crazy. And so we're, uh, we're up there and, and we had put together a terrific program. I knew it was one of those things where there was so much value in it that, you know, it was like, uh, I, I don't want to say it was an open net goal or it was, uh, you know, it was like the, you know, the field goal goals posts were this far apart, but I felt really good about it. So anyway, we get in there, we're sitting in front of them and I'm, I'm uh, going through the process of explaining the, the, the incredible value that was in this deal. And, and the two of them are sitting there and they're, they're kind of looking at me. It's, it's like you're staring at a couple of statues. And, uh, and so a colleague that I'd known forever, by the way, looks up at me and she says, it's not good enough. I went, I beg your pardon? She said, it's just not good enough. And I said, all right, I'm calling for a timeout. She says, you are? I said, yeah. I said, David, my boss, meet me outside. And <laughs> there's a problem with calling a timeout. You see, if you call a timeout, you can't come back with the same deal. Otherwise, there was no point in doing it. And somebody looked stupid when they did it. I hate to use that word, but it's, uh, or, or let's, let's say it was ill-advised, which is much kinder. So we walk out in the hallway and I realize we're in the customer's building and there's nowhere to go. There's no meeting rooms. So the two of us huddle into a corner. And I, he says, he looks at me, he says, Tinny, he says, you better know what you're doing here. We're going to get creamed. And I said, David, I said, just, just trust me on this one. Pause, pause. What, what more one or two things can we add to this to give them a win? Because you see, some people, when they negotiate, they want to get to the very end. And there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. Uh, some buyers call it the bonus round, where they pause, they stop things. Others call it, and it, it, it's kind of a, uh, it, it's a strategy where they get everything that they want, and then they go and, and, and. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different ways of doing this. But we went back in, and I said, all right. We're willing to do the following to get this across the finish line, and I know you're going to love it. And they look back and they say, great, we'll do it. But, you know, it's, it's having that clarity to, to not get caught in the speed of the negotiation. See, because really smart buyers, if they speed up your brain, if they speed up your brain, you get into uh, that whole crocodile mentality where, you know, uh, alligators only do one thing. They open and they close or they throw their tail. They don't have this, all these other things that, you and you, uh, that the humans have. And sometimes humans get caught into speed thinking and they start to get anxious and they start to, I always say when things are moving too quickly in a negotiation, I don't know if you were, when, when you were a kid, whether you had those, uh, those 10 speeds where you could uh, uh, cycle backwards when you're going down a hill just because it was fun. But I do that to reduce stress and to clear my mind in the middle of a negotiation and say to myself, all right, Pat, back to our cost modeling. What is the other side doing right now? Focus on them. Focus on who is relating to who in, in, in the building. Uh, you know, that awareness that's going on. And then back to your value equation. You see, because um, price is, is only a representation of value. That's all it is. Price is only a representation of value. And when it becomes something other than a representation of true value, in other words, it becomes nothing more than a, than a pile of gravel, then you're negotiating for a pile of, of, of gravel, even though you've got an amazing 
uh, software uh, proposition. Let's go back to let's go back to our friend Mary. First thing, she's got to understand all of her backup plans A, B, C, D, E, F, G. She's got to have those one. So the way that I do that is I I want to look at all the potential scenarios. So I try to this is what I call murder boarding, but I'm walking in and I want Mary to say, well, it could go here, could go here, go, go, go here. So she's got all that. Same yep. thing is emotional control. Yep. So the ability to know um, when to, you know, or, or the ability to go in there with confidence and be able to back away. She, she has to um, understand what her negotiating position is, so what her limits are. And, and then she's got to realize when is she negotiating with herself. So when to slow things down, when to speed things up, when to walk away. I think that goes back to, to planning in advance. At what point would I pause? At what point would I walk away? So it's same thing in the pause. I mean, I've used this in the past where I've got a client who is, has said, these are the words, when I know they've picked me, like the, I wanna do business with you, I gotta get a better deal. So first I've got the commitment, they're gonna pick me. Then they're working on a deal and the deal is below where my limits are. I go to the firewall. So I'll say, my pause will be, can you give me a moment and I'll call my manager and he, he's got a little bit better negotiation, you know, stand than I, can I call him and, and give him, and I'll take, grab my cell phone, walk out in the hall and call my manager. Um, but one, one tactic that I've used in situations where if I'm Mary, for example, and the, the, the buyer wants to do business with my company, the buyer is saying, clearly, I want to do business with you. That's different than a detached buyer. The buyer that says, well, we don't know, but you give us our, your best deal and then we'll decide. Yeah, we'll get back to you. Yeah, I don't, I don't negotiate deals like that. That's scratching lottery tickets. I don't play those games. I mean, I literally <laughs> will not play that game. Um, yeah, you know what? You know, I just, I just don't have time to scratch logic because that's not to say that's a wrong thing. I just don't play the game. If the person says, give us your best price, we'll come back to you. I can just tell you, Jeb Blunt, never going to be there. I'm always going to walk away from those deals. I don't like them. And I've got, I've got way too much confidence in my ability to go get other opportunities that I don't have to play that. So that, that's the confidence piece. But when the person says, I really want to do business with you, but we got to figure out a way to make this work. In some cases, what I'll do is I'll say, and if I were Mary, I would say, okay, here's the deal. Here's my agreement. Here's the contract. Here's the pricing that you said. I can't agree with this. I have no ability to sign this deal. But if you sign the contract, my manager is more pliable. So I negotiate a signature, not a deal. And yeah, I, I don't and know. It works, I, 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 oh, it works, it works, it works, it works, it works. It's the, like the greatest tactic ever. Because <laughs> if they're willing to sign for the deal yeah. and my manager can say yes to it, yeah. makes sense? Yeah. And, I want it, and I want it well enough. As soon as they sign the deal, it's done. Because my manager is never going to turn it down. Why not? Well, you know what? Let me just say this. There are different cultures in different companies. And so we've, we've established that uh, some uh, management organizations won't let you negotiate at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I joined the Southern Newspaper Group and I said, well, you know, what about if I get out uh, working on a deal and I can get this done? Uh, you know, uh, what is my negotiation channel? And the, the manager looked at me at the time. He says, uh, we don't negotiate. I said, okay, let me get my dictionary out. So I opened up my dictionary, took my pen out, and I scratched out negotiation out of my dictionary, closed it, put it back in my drawer. I said, well, now, when, now we know where we stand. But we were in a seller's market at that point yeah. where, there, where there was too many buyers and not enough sellers, and we knew it. Um, so it, it, it depends, you know, and, and this is where you've got to be, be careful. But we're back to Mary. And so um, what, what she has to do is, is not get too excited. Stay in the present. One of the, one of the things that, uh, you, uh, you know, when you get thinking about EQ is, is am I too far ahead? Am I too far behind? If I get too far ahead, in my own head, I start to negotiate with myself. If, mm -hmm. you've got you, if you've got your work up and you understand the objectives, you can close those objectives. You understand what your A to F plans are, whatever that is. And, and, and you just sit across from the person and, and, and you're, you're saying to them, we're this close. We're this close. Tell me the thing that is separating us from closing this deal. Now, that doesn't happen very often, to be honest, uh, uh, Jeb, because generally, if you're at the table, people actually do want to get a deal done. So to be honest with you, uh, some of the best deals that, that you'll run into are the ones that close quietly because you're saying, you know, I, I try to help people understand that, um, you know, 
relationships are so important in generational selling. It's so important. You know, I know I'm not going to be the first person you call because I'm not a family member, but you know, when you're dealing with important clients, they got to be somewhere in that first four or five calls if something is wrong. Right. The second thing is, is that we're all walking brands. Okay. Companies negotiate with salespeople. They negotiate on products. And finally, they recognize companies. It's not the other way around. And there's a reason. Because if anything goes wrong on implementation of the deal, that person is a person you either trust or you don't. And when I was dealing with some of the most important customers I, I dealt with, uh, and I've, I've, you know, I've had years to talk to a, a couple of people afterwards, they said, well, what was this, the thing that kind of swung the deal? And my one friend would say, you know, Pat, I would get like dozens and dozens and dozens of deals across my uh, desk uh, in, in a week. And he said, they're all compelling. I mean, these are great deals. But the question I asked myself is, who could I trust to implement with the least amount of hassle and risk? It, it, you know, you think about it, the number one reason why people don't change is because they're afraid of the risk of doing business with you. They're afraid that you're going to disrupt their business in the process. And that's the greatest negotiating position to be in is that you reduce the risk of, as a salesperson, the implementation of the business. And you know what the risk is going to be if you've done your discovery. Patrick, thank you so much for spending time with us today. This was an incredible conversation about negotiation. Can you do me a favor and tell our, our viewers where they can get the book, where they can get uh, more information about you, and how they can connect with you and interact with you? Absolutely. First of all, Je Jeff, let me thank you by saying this was a passionate discussion, and passionate discussions are great, and, and, and we challenge each other which is great. And, and that's the give and take that goes on in great negotiations. Uh, you can reach me at my website, which is centroid, centroidmarketing.com. Um, my book, Unlocking Yes, uh, can be purchased uh, on Amazon around the world. In Canada, we also have them in our, in our chapters bookstores. And um, if you, uh, you want to reach out to me, I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, and all the other uh, social media uh, channels. Uh, but uh, I, I just, if I can leave anybody with a, with a, with a thought, it's, it's that when you negotiate deals, don't think about today. Think about the, the, the longer haul. And if you have beautiful customers, you, you want to negotiate deals where everybody steps away from the table saying, I understand what I just negotiated and I really enjoyed the process. That is beautiful advice.